Hello, yes, that's right. It's Joe here live for Joyrider TV, just as you were expecting. Yes, at the, this isn't, um, I'm not planning for this to be a new regular time of uh, the Q&A session. It's just that I've been away today and I got back a little bit later than optimal for the regular time. So I hope this works out for everyone. I'm sure this will certainly be better for everybody who's tuning in from Australia. Um, so uh, possibly we could make this a regular thing if it works better for the majority of people, then we can make this the regular time of the Q&A. Yes, we can. Okay, so I'm just going to fire in with what is the most exciting news from Joyrider TV this week. And I would say it has to be the Hobie Getaway Speed Stick Challenge. What? I hear you cry. What on earth is the Hobie Getaway Speed Stick Challenge? Well, unfortunately for a lot of you, um, this is an exclusive challenge for sailors of the Hobie Getaway. Doesn't have to be your boat. You can borrow one, rent one. Um, or any other way of getting on a getaway for a speed stick run. But what we're doing is by the end of the year, whichever Hobie getaway has got the highest speed, there's a big prize. The big prize is a Melcheski Composites telescopic tiller extension. Now, if you didn't know, these are some of the nicest tiller extensions you can either get your hands on. And this prize has got a value of something like, I don't know, 250 US dollars. So this is a very good prize for getaway sailors. So if you've got a getaway or if you happen to have given your getaway to your youngest son, then steal it back for a session. Get out there, put in a big speed, get on the speed stick. And that sweet tiller extension could be yours if you can sail your getaway faster than every other getaway who are submitting speeds. Oh, yes. Anyway, this is, of course, a Q&A session, which has been recorded live, um, where you are supplying the questions and I'm coming through with the answers. So if you've got any questions do put them in the live chat. Um, if you're not uh, able to be here live and you're watching this later on, then just if you have got any questions, put them into the comments section and uh, I'll respond to your questions in next week's Q&A. There we go. All right, let's just check in with everybody who's checking in. So we've got Doby on board. Great to have you with us, Doby. Um, also on board, uh, we've got Andy and Adele uh, tuning in from Moreton Bay, Brisbane, Australia. Looking forward to see some more Southern Hemisphere sailors joining the Q&A with this new time. Yeah, I think I get the idea that this new time could be quite popular. We've got Joaquin tuning in uh, from Argentina, Southern Hemisphere. Oh, yes. Uh, great to have you with us. Um, we've got Aaron on board, who I believe is in New Zealand. So I think this new time, uh, Aaron loves the new time. Uh, I believe it's because it's not quite as much uh, the crack of before the crack of dawn, which has got to be a good thing. We've got Toot on board in Texas. Nice to have you with us, Toot. Always a pleasure. Never a chore. Uh, Matteo is on board with a question. I think let's let's get in there. Um, what are your tips for a first time tidal sailor who's racing today in the ocean? Is this this is going to require a diagram? I'm going to come back to this in a jiffy. That means a small amount of time uh, because before I do that. I've already started to prepare some pictures for our first preloaded question. So I'll just check in with everyone who's checking in. 
We'll go through this. If anybody can guess what this is going to be about, then um, I'll be impressed. But um, put it in the live chat. Uh, and then we'll do that. And then we'll talk about uh, racing in Tide. All right. We've got Eluin MP4 on board. Great to have you with us. Uh, Hanny's with us from a snowy Amsterdam. Oh, my goodness. That must be quite a shock after coming home from Mauritius uh, to be in the snow. Oh, yeah. We've got Graham on board, I'm guessing, somewhere in South Africa. Who says, are you coming to the South African Tiger Nationals in Langerbahn? Do you know what? This would be one of the, let's say, one of the five events that, of the year that I would absolutely love to come to. But unfortunately, at the moment, I've just got far too much on on the Wild Wind Beach and um, travelling now to South Africa to sail in the Tiger Nationals, uh, although I would absolutely love to. Um, I just can't get away at this time. But um, all right, so if you're wondering why is the South African Tiger Nationals one of the best events to go to, well, it's because my most of my racing career has been sailing Hobie Tigers uh, while Hobie was still supporting the Hobie, Hobie Tiger. Uh, but since Hobie is a band, well, the Tiger got replaced by the Wildcat, which only really races in the F-18 class. And the Hobie Tiger is no longer a viable choice if you want to race F-18. So the, uh, the only way to really race in the Hobie Tiger class is at the South African Nationals, which is the best fleet in the world they'll probably get 25 boats maybe even 30 boats at the nationals and there are some of the best cat sailors in the world down there as well so it really does make it a great competition not only that but Langerbahn in the western cape has got very very good wind as well uh, i'd say on average most days between 18 and 24 knots probably on the race course so it is white knuckle high octane full power racing which is very exciting indeed so that is why I would go to the South African nationals if I could thank you very much okay so we've got Fred on board who says I'm glad you're answering because I don't have any answers very are. You heard it here first. OK, Ted's on board. This is Ted from the shores of Alligator Lake in Florida. Right. Just be careful when dipping a toe in that one by the sounds of it. All right. Oh, yes. Um, Fred says he's guessing the picture. How to mount a Gatling gun on the side of a Hobie 16. Yeah, I can see how you could uh, see that. But... It's not a 16 because we haven't got the sidebars. Ah, you see. Uh, good guess, though. Yeah. So I think I'm just going to jump in and spill the beans on what we're talking about here. So uh, this question has been put to me by Philip on Patreon. And we're talking about mast rotation. Oh, yes. So the first part of the question is the mounting of the mast rotation system. Because in Show Us Your Cat last uh, Sunday, where we were looking at the Hobie 18 reimagined, um, John had moved the spanner bar, which is the name of this bar that comes off the mast with which we control the mast rotation. And uh, Philip asked, why would you do that? How would you do that? And then that, um, and here is Philip in the live chat. That's the one. Um, and then um, what, when and why would we change our mast rotation? I don't know if that was part of the question, but I think it's probably quite interesting. So we'll talk about that anyway. All right. So the kind of traditional way of having the mast rotation mounted so we've got this bar, which is called the spanner bar, 
which basically gives us leverage on the mast. So as we know, on a catamaran, we have got a rotating mast. So the mast can go around like this, or of course the other way. Um, and with this bar, what we can do is restrict how far it goes around. Now the mast is always going to want to rotate as far as it can, uh, which if it didn't have any restriction at all, would go round to probably 90 degrees or perhaps even a little bit further forwards. And the reason it would stop is because that's when the rigging uh, holding the mast up would prevent um, that from happening. So um, what we use is a restrictive mast rotation system. So with the traditional system, this is a side profile of the view. This is the boom. This is the mast. This is the sail. That spanner bar would be here like that. And then what we would have, um, let's have a boom on this other picture, shall we? Sorry, I mess. The colours aren't consistent, but I think we can we can handle that. So this is the boom. Um, and then what we have coming off the spanner bar is a line. This might just be a straight line or it might be a two to one, a double purchase for a bit more purchase uh, to make it easier. But that line will come off there. It will go through a cleat, which will hold the line. Hold the line, boys. Um, and um, basically, the tighter we pull this line, the more the mast is going to be in line with the boom. Are we good so far? Yes, I think we are. OK, so on this picture here, the uh, the cleat would be as far back here as we can manage. And then the line would come through the cleat like that to hold the um, the line. There we go. So the tighter we pull the line, the more the mast is in line with the boom. So that is the traditional method. And to be honest, that is the position where I put, where I have the mast rotation on my Tornado, Bad Boy 94, um, because I just like not to have it the other way because I like to have space around the trampoline. But the other method which is what John Forbes was doing with those reimagined Hobie 18s. We can't really draw it on here particularly well, but what he does is he will put the mast spanner at the bottom like that, so it's just above the trampoline. This is definitely the popular way of doing it, like in the Tornado class, uh, F-18s and F-16s, pretty much any modern racing boat in the A class um, with mast rotation, it would go here. The reason why the mast rotation is being led here is because it can then be rigged so that you can adjust it from pretty much anywhere on the boat, but more importantly, you can adjust, adjust it from the trapeze, um, which can be useful to save time and to save you having to get into the boat to go to the boom, to uncleat it or cleat it. Um, so very useful. So the routing of the line. So we've got our trampoline here. Yeah. What we have. So if we now assume that this mast spanner is in this position at the bottom, uh, what we'd have mast spanner. And then this is a very basic version. In fact, um, a very basic version of this system. We'd have a hole in the trampoline. Um, this hole will be heavily reinforced because it is um, uh, needs to be very strong. And then we'll draw the rope in red. 
Um, so the rope would go. We're going to draw a cleat first, two cleats. So, and in fact, I'm going to get rid of this picture so it's out of the way. So we'll have a cleat like here um, and a cleat like here, perhaps some sort of fair lead like there or a small block or something. And then the line for the mast rotation would you'd have it maybe tied off or on elastic or something to make it tidy and it will go through the cleat then um under the trampoline or if you haven't got a loose sided trampoline sort of like on the hobie 18s we were looking at it would go through a hole in the trampoline like this and then i'll draw it with a dotted line for where it's going under the trampoline coming out, going around through the end of the spanner bar, back down and then like that. So that means that you can then adjust the mast rotation from the trapeze. There are many different ways that you could rig this, like on the, um, on the C2 and on many F18s you would actually have this going through a block and then that block would go um, that there'd actually be a system on here to release that block. So if you wanted to, you could release it really quickly. Um, but that would be the system that we would be looking to use if you want to have this on the fly mast rotation system. All right. So um, just scanning through because this is Philip's question. I can see Philip in the live chat there. He said he almost got done for a speeding to get home to watch this. Well, glad he didn't uh, keep it safe out there. Uh, Philip said it looked more like it was on the crossbar. Um, yeah, perhaps I should have had a look at those pictures before entering into responding to this. But um, if it's if this isn't uh, the kind of vibe that John was doing with the 18, then I will uh, look at this again. But this would be the common sort of system for an on the fly mast rotation control mechanism. Sorry, but it's not on the crossbar, but I don't know how you would do that, perhaps, unless. Um, let's think. Could you do it so that this line goes up to the crossbar? So if we do the alternative route, would this work if the rope went in and then underneath? Or even, um, yeah, underneath, always better. And then somehow maybe comes around the front of the crossbar for a cleat. I would still go for this. Because even if it is on the crossbar, I'd go for this because it means that the lines for the mast rotation are right in um, the action area where everybody can get hold of them very easily and you can adjust the mast rotation whilst on the trapeze. All right. So now let's go on to why would you move the mast rotation? What's the point? Um, so first, firstly, in a normal sailing situation, what we want to do with the rotation of the mast, so if this is our mast, it's kind of like this shape. There's two different reasons why we are changing the, uh, the the angle of the mast. So the first thing that we're doing with the mast is we're using the mast as part of the sail. So we're actually adding to our sail area using our mast. So here's the mast and then here's the sail like this. 
And then what we're having here is the mast and the sail perfectly in line so that the wind that is going over the back of the sail, especially, so this is the back of the sail, it's got the smoothest path that it can travel. So if you want to have a look on your boat to see what is a good angle of the mast, what you want to do is pull it in as much as possible, but keeping it so that this is as much of a straight line as possible. If we pull the mast in too much, what we'll get is this will come like this and like make a kind of M shape on the back of the sail. So what will happen here is some of the airflow will just disconnect from the back of the sail and um, you'll lose quite a lot of power um, and efficient airflow like that. And we'll also have something a bit juicy going on on the windward side of the sail. So we're not having the mast in tighter until we've got the downhaul on tight for that reason. Because once the downhaul's tight, sorry, uh, the sail will be much flatter. Which means this is going to be a straight line. But when the downhaul's looser, so when we're looking for power, you're going to have a big curve in the sail, which gives us this sort of M shape on the back side, which is going to uh, promote turbulent airflow. And we're not going to get as much efficiency out of our rig. So that is reason. That is the reason. Well, the first thing that we're looking for when setting the mast rotation. Um, and then the other thing that we should consider with the mast rotation is the bend in the mast. So our mast being kind of this kind of shape, bending this way, it's not going to bend so much because that is the thick section where it's going to be much stiffer. Whereas this way, this narrower section, it is going to bend more. So what we can do is we can actually pull the mast in, which is going to expose this section more, allowing the mast to bend off at the top. Very good. If um if you're not with if you're not following this at the moment, don't worry because there is the default setting. So if we get our boat back. So, yeah, what are we actually going to do with our, there is a default setting. So let's take a look at what that will be. Here's our boat. And what we've got on our boat is some visual references. But if you are rigging your mast spanner at the bottom of the mast, you can actually put some lines on the trampoline especially if you've got a grey trampoline, very easy with a black permanent pen. If you haven't got a grey trampoline, if you've got a black one, a bit more tricky, but you'll work something out, I'm sure. Um, you can put little marks on the trampoline like this. These could be like reference points where you're going to point your spanner bar to. But the standard... Uh, place to put the mast rotation if this is the shroud here is we want to have the mast for most situations so that the mast spanner is pointing just behind the shroud the reason we're doing that is because of this to reduce this kind of M shape on the backside of the, the sail. But also it means 
that when we sheet in the main sheet, because the mast is round quite a lot, it means, can I draw this? Possibly. Let's not worry about it. Um, but what it means is when we sheet in the main sheet, the top part of the mast above where the rigging anchors, uh, the hounds will call that, we can uh, bend quite easily towards the back, which makes it a lot easier to sheet in. And we can do much more with our sail shape by having the mast round like that. So when would we not have the mast like that? OK, so the first one is if we're going around the windward mark in a race and we're going to start sailing downwind. Um, because the other thing, just to backpedal a little bit, the other thing we're doing with our mast here is we've lined up the mast, the sail and the wind. Oh, yes. So it's all in line. But then as we turn downwind, what we can do, maybe we can draw the downwind mast in red, um, in a slight, yeah, in red. So downwind, we can turn the mast, com completely release the mast rotation so that the mast is pointing down the beam. Because as we know, when we're sailing downwind, the wind is coming from here. Um, but not only that, it means that when we sheet in, we're really supporting the mast if we're flying the spinnaker by having the mast pulled back as much as possible. Very nice. So that is position two, which would be for downwind. So what you might do is when you're approaching the top mark of your race course, you just bang the mast rotation off and... Um, mast goes all the way out and you're ready easy all right and the third position is for upwind sailing when it is very windy so what we would do is keep the mast in position one until the downhaul is on as tight as you possibly can get it that is both hands on the downhaul bending your knees and really cranking it on um because again this m shape thing um we're trying to reduce and we're trying to keep the mast in the sweet spot but if having pulled the downhaul as tight as we possibly can if we're still overpowered um then what we would want to do is we're basically going to pull the rotation on so that the mast and the spanner this is different from boat to boat but generally so that that spanner is pointing at the end of the back beam so we're only changing it by a small amount but it will make a big difference with your power but we don't want to do that until the downhaul is maximum i hope that helps um, that is a fairly all-inclusive explanation about the mast rotation um, at this stage in the game. Uh, is anybody else hot in here? I'm just going to... Um... Remove a layer. Okay. Thank you very much, Philip. I'm glad that was helpful. Um... All right. So just scrolling back in the live chat to the, there was a question from Matteo, um, who is asking, what would be your tips for going out racing in tide? Okay, this is quite a big topic. So what, because say uh, catamarans are very fast, they are really affected by wind strength. So what you need to decide when you're looking at your race course and the situation that you're in, all that kind of caper, is what is going to have a greater effect? Is it 
the differences in amount of wind on the race course, or is it going to be differences in the amount of tide on the race course? Um, so how can we illustrate this? If this is our course, um, and let's say we are going upwind into the tide. This is quite um, quite sort of standard or typical. Um, so can we draw the tide like this? And let's say the tide is less as we come over this side like that. And then it's most on this side. So um, how are we going to know where the tide is strongest? Well, it really does differ from place to place. So one of the best things you can do is speak to other sailors who are very experienced sailing uh, in that area or um, have a look at some uh, tidal diagrams, which will actually tell you uh, what the differences are in current uh, how much the tide flows in different areas. Um, and one reason why the tide, why the current might be faster in one place to another place is the depth of the water, perhaps other obstructions, like if this was a river and there was some sort of bits sticking out in the river, there might be let fewer tidal uh, less tide on one side so what we want to do if we're sailing this is going to seem maybe it's going to seem quite obvious but if we're sailing to get to the windward mark there and let's say the wind is completely even throughout the course so there's no difference in wind strength then we're definitely not going to want to go to the right side here because this tide is just going to push us back massively. We're going to want to, as soon as we've got enough distance away from the buoy to be able to tack safely without getting pushed back onto it, then we're going to tack, get over to the side of the course where there's less tide. And then we might want to tack a little bit later. Like, so if there was no tide, as we know, when we tack, we end up at 90 degrees. So you might tack here. But with the tide, we know we're going to get pushed down. So maybe as your strategy, you want to go a bit further. So you're not going to end up here because the tide's going to push you down. So you're actually going to be going here and you still end up on the buoy if you want to end up right on the boy. So that would be um, number one. Number two is going to be, you need to know what time the tide is going to be changing. Perhaps you're taking part in a fairly juicy competition where there are like four races in a row. Perhaps during that time, the tide is going to change direction. You need to know what time it's going to change direction. And again, look at some tidal diagrams, perhaps speak to other sailors or local people, fishermen. They're always very friendly, um, especially if you buy a fish. Um, and find out if, like, when the tide changes at low tide, where does it change first? It's not just going to go shum, shum, like that. It will probably have a bit of a shum, Maybe the weakest tide will go completely slack first, no movement, uh, followed by the strongest bit. Um, so find out and make sure you know what time it's changing. But one of the um, number three is be aware that, like we were saying here, that when you tack for a boy, like if you have gone out this way, 
and you're wanting to just put in one tack to get around the boy, be aware that you are going to have to go further than you would do if you were sailing in a situation without tidal current. So you might have to sail to here to tack and then the tide is actually going to bring you down this way. There we go. And then on the downwind leg, when we're coming back down, it's going to be beneficial to get to the boy jibe, get into this strong stuff, which is going to bring us down quicker. And then again, we're going to jibe earlier because this is pushing us down and we don't want to sail a longer distance than we need to. So there we go. Now, where this all changes is if there are differences in wind strength on the race course, if the wind strength differences are so much that we can maybe, uh, if you can, on, let's say on this side of the course, if there's not quite enough wind to lift the hull slightly, but on this side of the course, there is enough wind, then you'd want to get into the stronger wind first course, depending on which class of boat you're sailing. So it is a big topic, but uh, we've just touched the, sur scratched the surface here. I hope that is helpful in some way, um, but good luck. Thank you very much. All right, we've been going 36 minutes. We're just going to take a short commercial break. Ah, very nice. Um, yeah, okay, so back to the live chat. Um, where are we up to here? Johnny Wan is in um, agreement that mass rotation is a very interesting topic. Great to have you with us, Johnny Wan. Um, Scott's on board, dropping it in the slot. Um, he says, good morning. And um, thanks to Toot for all of the info and contact info for sailing on Lake Buchanan. Nice. All right. Water temperature at Lake Buchanan, by the way, is 60 degrees and warming up. All right. Graham says cleat should be on the hulls so that you can reach it on the trapeze. Yeah. With the adjustable on the fly mast rotation system. Uh, if you missed that, by the way, you will want to rewatch this whole thing from the start afterwards so that you don't miss that because this is fascinating stuff. All right. Um, what else we got? We got Russell on board. To keep up the good work. You keep up the good work too, Russell. Uh, always great to have you with us. Um, so um, just scrolling through, looking at what is relevant. Graham says, who's uh, Graham from South Africa, uh, talking about the Hobi Tiger sailing. So he says, we start off with the spanner aiming for the stays, the shroud, but play it a lot once the downhaul is fully down. Yeah, so like we we're saying there, uh, once your downhaul is all the way on, and one thing with the downhaul on a boat like a Hobie Tiger F-18 or Tornado is there is more, generally, more downhaul available than you think. When you think you've pulled on the downhaul all the way, there is a possibility that you can pull it on more. And when you pull it on more, then the boat, upwind especially, just goes so much faster. And it is so satisfying to get it in that spot. Because when you pull the downhaul on um, maximum, your sail, especially at the top, just becomes a blade, completely flat, very efficient, very fast. And um, you will go so much quicker upwind if it's windy, if you've got the downhaul on enough. There we go. All right. Um, by the way, if you are uh, thinking that's a nice T-shirt, Joe. Yes, uh, totaljoyrider.com. This one's called Send It. Um, which quite nicely brings us on to, I'll get back to the live chat shortly, um, the second preloaded question in today's 
chat, um, which is from Aziz, who we've seen in Show Us Your Cat and in What Went Wrong. He was say he's now sailing a top cat in Egypt. And he says on the um, I don't know if you've seen these videos, but they are the relative speeds on. Um, so I went out and on various different boats and sailed them. I would call it normally and with the GPS on. And then we got in different wind conditions the relative boat speed on different points of sail. So upwind would be about 12, maybe. Beam reach, 17. Broad reach, 16. And then what Aziz's question was, was these videos all finished off with a point of sail that I called full send. Okay. Full send is what I'm calling sailing the boat as literally as fast as I possibly can in those conditions. So this is good for the getaway sailors as well, trying to win that sweet tiller extension. So the way to get the most speed possible out of your boat is. I'm just going to draw the wind. Just, I'm just going to represent it as an arrow. Wind coming this way. Full send. This is how to achieve it. Start off sailing on a beam reach. So sailing across the wind like this. If your boat has got a double trapeze, if you've got two people on the boat, then double trapezing is going to help. Um, and what we're trying to do to get the boat to go as fast as possible is every time this windward hull comes out of the water completely, that is a sign that we can convert this energy. There's quite a lot of, I think if you've ever tried lifting up your boat on the beach, you'll know how much energy it takes to lift a hull out of the water completely quite a bit. So we can transfer that energy from hull lifting energy to more speed. So if the hull lifts, what we're going to do is turn more downwind. So I'm not going to draw this in line. I'm going to do it like here. Hull lifts. We're going to turn more downwind. Of course, we don't want to capsize. We don't want to stick the nose in. So before, as we turn more downwind, we're just going to ease a bit of main sheet because that is going to um, take the pressure off the bow of the boat um, as we ease the main sheet. Um, and then once we're on this new course, we'll pull the main sheet in again and We'll basically repeat that process. If on the new point of sale, when you sheet in, we can still fly the hull. That means we can turn even further downwind. And then in, if the wind is as much as, let's say, 20, 25 knots, um, then you should be able to get your boat really far downwind. In fact, further downwind than a traditional broad reach, uh, Ramschultz, um, with the sails in tight, with the hull in the air and standing in the trapeze at the back, that is what I am calling full send. This is going as fast as you possibly can. There we go. So, Getaway sailors, we want some full send this season. I'd love to see um, if you are going to go out setting a speed stick record, especially if you're really going to push it, put a camera on your boat. Because um, one of the worst things that can happen is if something epic happens while you're out sailing and nobody else saw it. So if you have got the opportunity to put a camera on the boat, then yes, you should. And the, the most straightforward camera mount after having it on your head 
is the bridal uh, mount, which I did do a video about how you can make very easily and for not much money, a bridal mount. Uh, you'll have to check that out. All right. So just backpedaling into the live chat. Um, I hope everyone's having a good time. Uh, by the way, I hope everyone's got a great weekend planned. If you're getting out on the water this weekend, uh, why not get on the speed stick this weekend? Uh, the speed stick is still quite not. It hasn't got many entries on it at this time. So it's a good time to get involved. All right. So. Yeah, Graham says feels like pre blend also influences the starting position. Yeah. So with the we're talking about mast rotation again. There is, um, we can pre-bend the mast on many of these boats using, I'm not going to go into it heavily, um, not just, in fact, I think I'm not going to go into it at all at this time, just because um, of the later starting time of the Q&A, it does make it a bit more important that I finish on time, uh, I'm afraid. So uh, there you go. Um, but yes, I would agree, Graham, uh, pre-bend will also influence your mast rotation settings. But as a standard kind of like general rule, just behind the shroud or side stay is a good starting point. And then the most you'd want to pull it on, I would say, is to the back beam, I would say. Uh, depends on the type of boat, though. All right, we got Cux Oli on board from Northern Germany, Guten Tag. Uh, it, das ist gut to have you with us. Uh, glad that you tuned in. Also from Germany, we've got Marcus from GER2 in the Tornado Fleet. We've got a little exclusive club in the Tornado Fleet, and that is for everybody whose sail number is two. Um, my sail number is GBR2. Marcus has got GER2. I believe um, the Australian guys have got AUS2. And there's probably some other twos out there as well, which I can't remember just now. It's been a while since I've been at a tornado event. Okay. Uh, Toot says, you need to look up Joe's music videos. His band is quite good. Wish I could see them live. Well, you can all see um, it <laughs> live if you come to Vasiliki, Greece. That's right. All right. So uh, Graham says we're still on the mast rotation. I'd aim for the back of the centerboard. Back beam is extreme. Yeah, it's definitely boat dependent. On the tornado, we go to the back beam when it's windy, um, which gives us a little bit more range. But it's because on the tornado, perhaps with the thinner tapered mast, this makes a difference. All right. So we've got Roberto on board. Buongiorno, Roberto. Great to have you with us. How are you doing? Very good. We're just getting revved up for the new season at um, Wild Wind Sailing Holidays here in Greece. All right. Yeah, Graham's really coming through today with some good info. Um, on the topic of sailing in tide, Graham says sail the long leg into the tide and short across it. Yeah. So if we've got the tide coming, coming down, you're not always going to have the option, of course, but if you, you want to be sailing further directly into the tide, if we can picture where the tide was coming down before, because when we're going directly into it, we're not getting pushed as much. Whereas when we're going across the tide, we're uh, presenting the side of our boat to the tide and we're going to get pushed down a lot more that way. There we go. All right. So we've got Lee on board in Macon, Georgia. Great to have you with us, Lee. Jake's on board as well. Uh, probably somewhere in the north of England somewhere, or maybe even Scotland. Uh, apologies, Jake, I can't 
remember from where it is that you hail. Okay, uh, Christian's on board as well. Um, this is a good question. That does the downhaul mean the same as the Cunningham? Short answer: Yes. Um, or kicking strap boom bang. Yeah, on um, a catamaran, what we're talking about, we don't generally have a kicking strap or boom bang. So, um, boom, mast, sail, like this. So, if you didn't know, if you if you've only ever sailed catamarans, you won't. You might not even be aware of this. But on monohulls and bigger catamarans, like uh, yacht catamarans, you will have what's called a kicking strap, which is a diagonal piece, a uh, uh, purchase system, almost like a smaller version of your main sheet that goes between the boom and the base of the mast. And the purpose of this is to hold the boom down so even if you uh, let your main sheet off, the boom doesn't lift. So it means that when you let your main sheet off, the boom goes out, but not up. So we keep the tension in the leech of the sail that makes the sail upwind more effectively. Now, on most catamarans, we don't have a kicking strap or boom vang like this. Instead, what we have is not just the main sheet. I won't draw this, but we have, yes, I will. Um, no, I won't. Um, gosh. Um, it's, the, it's the new later time. Makes it challenging. Um, this is the back beam of the boat. Um, there's a, oh, these are the sides of the trampoline. Very nice. Um, but what we have on the back beam is we have our main sheet, which is a very powerful purchase system. And then the main sheet attaches to a traveler, which can go all the way to the side of the boat. So, in terms of kicking strap or boom bang, what we're doing is we're using effectively, we're using the main sheet as the kicking strap or boom bang, and then we're using the traveler as we would use the main sheet. Um, in not exactly how we're using it, but the effect is that. So the effect of the main sheet is controlling the twist uh, in the sail and the tension in the back edge, whereas the traveller is controlling the angle of attack. So, for example, if you were sailing a laser, you would change the angle of attack of the sail using the main sheet, but you would control the leech tension of the sail, mostly with the kicking strap or boom bang. So, they have these different effects. But that is not to say that most of the time we're controlling the power on the boat using the traveller. If we only used the traveller, what would happen was we would capsize. Yes, the main sheet, as we know, has a very direct effect on the power on the boat. Letting the main sheet off is always going to do more than everything else. There we go. All right. So we got Ted with us. He says, when you adjust the trapeze connection, can you clip on the hook while sitting or do you have to sit up to get the hook on? Not sure what the best height is between the dog bone and the handle. This is a very good question. I think a good starting point for how, um, just in case you're not aware of the trapeze system on the Hobies, is we have – 
it's kind of like a combination trapeze ring and handle. It's called a J and H. Um, and then that goes with a rope up through an eye at the end of the trapeze wire. We'll have another handle on the trapeze wire. Very nice. And then that rope will come back down and it will go through this piece, which is commonly known as a dog bone. Um, which is Hobie call it a rope lock because that's what it does. This locks the rope in one specific uh, position. Um, so what Ted is asking is what sort of distance do we have here? What is the right amount that we have to pull this down uh, to hook it on? Uh, I would say it depends on your level of experience and um, uh, your level of experience and how comfortable you are with getting in and out on the trapeze. But a good starting point is when you pull the, the J and H down to hook on, you just want to lift yourself up a little bit so that when you sat on, the, when you sit down again, you can feel the trapeze pulling because the thing that's nice about that is that then gives you the reassurance but it's not going to come unhooked as you move out. And it's a good general height to start with as well. Um, if you have it longer, there's a bit more of a chance that it will come unhooked. Uh, and also, as you move out of the boat onto the trapeze, you're more likely to get hit by any waves or the water that's coming past. So this is going to have you a bit higher up out of the water. Now, one thing to consider as well as the J and H and your this system is your harness itself, and really, really, really make sure that the straps that go onto the hook are done up really, really, really as tight as possible. Because if they're not tight, then it's going to have the same effect as this being lower down, and you're going to be in the water when you go out. So there you go. All right, we've got Jadranka. Hello. I'm guessing possibly somewhere like uh, Czech Republic, Romania, Bulgaria, in that region. Uh, let me know if I'm right. I do enjoy a guess. Thanks very much for tuning in. You are my favorite YouTuber. Thank you very much. Uh, I really appreciate that. Glad that you're enjoying the videos and the live stuff. Christian is on board. Uh, Chris, Christian, who we spoke to about the downhaul Cunningham is in Galliano Island, Canada. Nice. Sounds interesting. Um, all right. And then final, uh, not the final question. We have got another question, actually. So, but the next one in the live chat, uh, no further questions, please, by the way. But um, Stoker's says what brand of and type of watch do you have well funny you should ask actually but i have always used for the last 30 years 30 years that's a long time i've always used the timex ironman triathlon watch i just find them really reliable and of course the longer you use the same thing you get used to it and it becomes almost like really, really second nature. So the Timex was always the one until uh, my previous one. Um, unfortunately, one of the pins broke. Uh, so I've stopped wearing that at the moment. Uh, but I replaced it with, this is some sort of Casio. I don't know what it's called, but this is just the watch that tells the time like that. It's a Casio. There you go. But what I use for, sorry, uh, for the GPS, which is the, the interesting one, is the Locosis GW60. Now, this, unfortunately, I'm not endorsed by Locosis to promote their product. 
but it is really good because what it does is it's a GPS watch and it not only tells you how fast you're going, but it gives you statistics as well. It will tell you what your speed was over two seconds, then over 10 seconds, then over 250 meters, then over um, 500 meters. And uh, for a lot of official speed records, you have to measure your speed over 500 um, meters. So there you go. The Loco Sys GW60. But I don't wear it as my everyday watch because um, you have to charge it. Whereas with a watch like this, with a regular battery, it just stays, you know, it works for, I don't know, one battery, probably about two years or something. Yeah. So there you go. Thanks for the question, Stokers. All right. Christian says, I noticed your guitars behind the whiteboard. Play us a jingle between scenes. Oh, I couldn't possibly. Uh, thank, but thanks. Uh, all right. Jad Ranker says, what brand of sales do you recommend? This is a massive question. It does depend on where you are in the world. But if you are uh, somewhere in Europe, there are two two brands that I would hit if you're sailing. Um, well, the one brand for F-18 has got to be 1D. They are absolutely smashing everything. Re in Europe, they are the most successful racing sail brand that there is. Um, if you're sailing a Tornado, then 1D are making Tornado sails but I would say OS3 because I use OS3 sales and they're based, uh, Thanos, who makes the sales. He lives in Vasiliki. His sail loft is in Vasiliki, Lefkus, Greece. And uh, we've been working together for a long time and his sales are very good and very quick. And you can give him the specifications that you require. And there you go. If you are sailing something like a Hobie 16, I would generally go first choice original, second choice for me, from my from what I've seen and from speaking to the international joyrider community, uh, whirlwind sales would be my second choice after original um, because they are exactly the same as original. The only downward side of the whirlwind sales is you wouldn't be able to use them in an official Hobie racing event. And then if you were looking for um, some very good, but less expensive sales, then forward sailing would be a very good starting point based in France. Uh, they make sales for many classes of catamaran and are very well priced. Hopefully, I'll be able to do some testing with some of their sales and equipment in the upcoming season. Watch this space. Thanks for your question. All right. Um, have I? All right. Last one in the preloaded is from Ryan in Maui. Um, and he says, should I just pull off the trampolines or trailer the entire boat? The whole boat away from coastal 60 miles per hour wind, code yellow, remove cat tracks, strap down orange, remove trampolines, strap down code red, get the trailer. We're working. Yeah, I would say take the trampoline off. If it is that windy, it how long does it? I know it's a pain, but how long does it take to take the trampoline off? You know, depends on the type of boat. I know between five and 15 minutes, let's say. So, um, yeah, take the trampoline off because it's peace of mind. You could then um, store the boat without the trampoline on. Like if it was going to be really windy and you were going to leave your boat in the boat park where you have it. First thing to do, drop the mast. This is 
First thing to do, actually, is make sure the boat is tied down very securely to the floor. Second thing, drop the mast. Third thing, trampoline off. And then you've done everything you can pretty much uh, to stop your boat from being blown away. There you go. All right. So um, just noticed Andy and Adele say the Apple Ultra is very good. Andy and Adele, is that a watch? The Apple Ultra? Sounds intriguing. Does sound expensive, but um, yes, I'd like to try one. All right. So next one. Uh, Philip says, I have a Garmin Surf GPS and tracker, plus it can alert three people of, of my choosing uh, who get a position of my location in an emergency. Now, that does sound like a very good feature. And I'd say that that probably beats the loco sis with its stats that it could actually save your life. So the Garmin Surf GPS does sound like a very good one. If anybody at Garmin would like to send me one to test out, I would be very happy to. Oh, yeah. So that is the Apple Ultra watch. All right. I'll check that out. Um, all right. We've got anonymous raccoon on board uh best stay anonymous i think especially if you're a raccoon um bit of a weird one here we go does wild wind offer weekend trips i have a family member who lives on the island and would love to go for a sale but can't afford the whole week yes so if um if you want to come to wild wind and just to do some sailing for you could start at half an hour you could have an hour you could have two hours half a day or a whole day or two whole days yes it is possible um all you need to do is in fact if you want a price list uh send me an email um joe at wildwind.co.uk and i'll send you a price list for how much that costs but yes, absolutely. And if it is a local person who's coming down, then we can do mega deals. That's what we can do. Thanks very much. All right. Joaquin says, what about modern square top sales for Hobie 16, Hobie 18 or anything else like that? Yeah, the this is going to be the last question, by the way. Um, so please, no further questions, because I've got to go for dinner. Um, the square top sale, what this does for you. Hmm. Few things. What is a square top sale? It's a sale which has a square top. These are battens, by the way, like that. And they'd, they'd be more. So on many types of boat, um, the square top sail is standard. Like in the F-16 class, F-18 class, in the Tornado class, the more modern or more, uh, what would you call them, more sophisticated designs with more sophisticated means of dealing with power the square top mainsail is pretty standard. Um, whereas with the older classes of boat, like the Hobies, the Prindles, things like that, you're more likely to have um, what in Greece, which I think is the best name for it, rather than the square top, you're more likely to have a cheese pie sail. Uh, the reason it's called a cheese pie is because that's the shape of a cheese pie in Greece. Um, now, what the square top does for you, number one, it will give you more performance in lighter winds. Because we've got more sail area at the top, it means in lighter winds, there's going to be more air up there, more uh, air movement, which means we are going to have more speed in less wind than with cheese pie. Mm. Number two, what will it do? Or, or number two related to number one you may go but if it does that isn't that going to mean 
that when it gets windy, we are hellishly overpowered. No, because with the square top sail, what that will do is when you really crank on the um, downhaul and you get the mast rotation in the right spot, then it really opens up the leech of the sail, the back edge, which allows us to spill the wind very efficiently. Nice. So that is number two. It's easy to depower with a square top sail. Now, the third thing with the square top sail is it kind of does some of the work for you. Um, because of the elasticity in the battens and because they're long, it means when a gust hits, the gust will open it up. And then if that amount of wind goes down again, less pressure, the batten will close again. So it's kind of like suspension, less work. Um, so back to answering the question uh, for a Hobie 16, Hobie 18. I haven't tried a square top sail on a Hobie 16, but I would be very interested to do it. But with a class like the 16, I'd have to say I feel that I'm a bit of a purist and I like the boat in its original state. So how it has come from the factory with the original sail. But that's not to say that I wouldn't absolutely love to try a square top on a 16. Um, so if I was a recreational sailor, you wouldn't be able to race with a square top sail on a 16 in any class racing. Um, but if I was a recreational sailor just going out to have a good time, no competition, would I get square top sail? If I tried one and I liked it, then yes, I, pop, I possibly would. But I do like the original sales. Not a particularly conclusive answer, but that's the only one I've got right now. So there we go. I think I'm going to wrap this up now. Um, thanks to everybody for tuning in and your uh, great questions. Um, I'll be back next week, uh, perhaps with some more Q&A, perhaps at the new time. I'll do a poll on um, the community tab to find out what everybody thinks. But it's nice to be able to have the um, Aussies and Kiwis down here for the q and I think that's a great feature with the new time. So there we go. So thanks to everybody. And I will see you soon with some more on Joyrider TV. In the meantime, I think you should binge watch as many videos as you can uh, because they're all there for you. Thank you very much. Time for breakfast and a cup of tea. Lovely. Uh, toot likes the new time. That means we're sticking with the new time too. Right. Thanks. Bye.